Companies are judged by the money they make. But some influencers, like Asahi Pompei, know that giving can say just as much about a company. Pompei worked as a senior attorney at The Economist and Pfizer before joining Goldman Sachs as a compliance officer in 2006. This year, Pompei became the bank's global head of corporate engagement and president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. She's here to talk about her unlikely journey from Guyana to Brooklyn to Goldman and the role of giving in the corporate landscape. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to Influencers and welcome to our guest Asahi Pompei, Global Head of Corporate Engagement and President of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. Asahi, welcome. Andy, it's great to see you again. So tell us first of all, you have two titles, maybe two jobs. What does that entail at Goldman Sachs? So I'm the president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation and also the global head of corporate engagement. And what does that mean? Well, over the last decade, Goldman Sachs has deployed $2.5 billion across our philanthropic footprint. Through our donor advice fund, Goldman Sachs Gives, we've donated $1.5 billion, a lot of that to needs-based financial aid. And so I feel extraordinarily fortunate, Andy, that I can help Goldman Sachs direct those philanthropic dollars in terms of the communities and the uh, areas and individuals who need it most. So historically, Asahi, let's face it, I mean, philanthropy was something that a company did sort of, you know, in the side door, yeah, we have to do that. But it seems to me it's become more core to companies like Goldman Sachs. Why is that and, and how is it connected to the core business? You're exactly right. It is core to what we do. As we think about Goldman Sachs more generally, we think about Goldman's focus on clients, Goldman's focus on growth, Goldman's focus on impacting the economy and helping businesses and clients grow. That same rigor and that same lens that we approach our client franchise, we do that across our philanthropic footprint as well. So my clients in part are our 10,000 small businesses that we work with through our Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program, as well as our 10,000 Women program. Those are our two signature programs of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. And so philanthropy is something that is central to what we do. Andy, if I were to take you to Goldman Sachs this afternoon and we walk into that lobby, what you would see is a huge mural on our ground floor that has the word service on it. And it has photos of individuals who've worked at the firm over the last 150 years. We're actually celebrating the firm's 150th anniversary this year. And it's about that life of service, whether it's Robert Rubin or Hank Paulson or other individuals, you know, who have contributed over the course of the firm's history. But that life of service and that being core to what we do is absolutely central. I mean, some people would say, look, I mean, Goldman Sachs is an investment bank. It's all about making money and that, you know, you're helping these people just to make yourselves look good or that you're, you know, sort of getting them into the Goldman Sachs fold. Is, is that the case or how does that work? People often ask exactly this, which is why is Goldman Sachs doing this? Here's what Goldman knows. We know the power of small business and we've decided to double down on helping small businesses across our country and across the world grow. To level set here are a few things. Mm -hmm. There are 30 million small businesses across the United States. Those 30 million small businesses account for 60 million jobs. Now, as you think of Goldman Sachs, and if, if there's one thing that people know and believe about us, is our ability to bring talent and rigor to help things grow. So we decided we wanted to bring that lens to small businesses across the United States. And we launched in 2010, post the financial crisis, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. We're at 8,200 businesses strong. You and I, um, we're, we're talking in Omaha when we were uh, at uh, Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meeting. And in particular, Warren Buffett and Mike Bloomberg are co-chairs of Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. And you know, if you and I would agree that if there are any two visionaries that know a thing or two about small businesses, it's certainly Buffett and Bloomberg. And so we brought that lens to small businesses to help them grow. And I have to tell you, the results are in and the results are phenomenal. 99% of individuals who participate and join our Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses program graduate. It's a program that's centered around three things, 
education, practical education to small businesses, and in particular, underserved small businesses, diverse small businesses, small businesses on Main Street in America who really need help. Secondly, they're focused on creating jobs in the communities. As we look at what's the result, does it matter? Why is Goldman doing this? Because we want to impact that ecosystem of small businesses to help communities grow. And so if you think about small businesses overall, you know, and you and I both know, that 50% of small businesses don't make it past the five-year mark. And only one in three make it past the 10-year mark. And so we brought our, our tools, our apparatus to bear on businesses across the country and we've been able to change that direction. In particular, as we look at the 8,002 businesses that we've studied, any number of them, upwards of 78% of them say that they've grown their revenue over 30 months. Compare that, benchmark that to a similar group of small businesses, that number is 47%. So our cohort is at 78% growing revenue, regular cohort 47%. What about job creation? As we listen to the news, uh, we can't turn it on without hearing about jobs and the importance of jobs and the importance of workforce. Well, that population of 8,000 businesses, as we've, uh, as we've polled them, have over 30 months, 57% of them have created jobs. Small businesses benchmark generally, only 25% of them create jobs. So that's the reason Goldman Sachs is doing it. And you've been at Goldman, Asahi, since 2006, I think, right? Yes. And you've seen, you mentioned diversity. I mean, you must have seen a tremendous increase, quite honestly, in diversity and inclusiveness at Goldman Sachs. How do you measure that? And, and in fact, have you seen that? Yes, I absolutely have seen that. And we measure it. If there's anything we go at Goldman Sachs is we measure, we track, and we metric. Now, I have to tell you, Andy, on a very personal level, um, I was part of Goldman Sachs's last partner class. And under the leadership of our CEO, David Solomon, Goldman Sachs entered 2019 with the partner class that had the largest number of women, 26% and the largest number of African Americans, 6% in the 150 year history of Goldman Sachs. Now we're certainly continuing to work and see those numbers grow, but it certainly speaks to the direction in which the firm is growing and its commitment on a very practical level to diversity and growing diverse talent. Well, let's talk about your personal story a little bit, Asahi. You grew up um, in Brooklyn, but came from Guyana, right? That's Talk correct. to us about that a little bit. Well, Andy, as you know, Guyana is a tiny country in South America. Its population is less than 800,000 individuals. And on October 7th, 1981, when I was nine years old, my family of seven came to Brooklyn, New York, to Foster Avenue in East Flatbush, and we moved into the Vanderbilt Housing Projects. Um, one might argue that's not a very likely path uh, to end up as a Goldman Sachs partner, but on a personal level, my life has really been marked by opportunity. Uh, the opportunity to study in Japan. I started studying Japanese. My name, as you know, means morning sun in Japanese, and I found that out when I was 14, just at the time that New York City public schools were increasingly offering Japanese programs. And so the principal of our school went to the top students in the school and said, what about studying Japanese? And I said, absolutely, count me in. I have the name. There you go. There's, <laughs> it, it's, been, it's meant to happen. Right. And that would lead to a 10-year um, of studying Japanese. Um, living in Japan, I lived with the Japanese family, the Otas in Hachioji for a year, and went via uniform on bicycle back and forth to, um, to Hachioji Koryo Koko in, in Hachioji, uh, Japan. And I think that international lens of having lived in Japan, I worked in Germany for over a year working on the Banker Stress Deutsche Bank merger and a number of other transactions, have informed my lens around philanthropy uh, as well. That must have been a real experience being an African-American girl in a Japanese school. What was that like? It was really phenomenal in three senses. One is people were extremely curious about you and curious about America and what you were doing. Two is they were super surprised that you could speak Japanese. Um, and in particular, they wanted to figure out ways in which they can explain to you more and unpack more around Japanese culture. And so I did tea ceremony, I did ikebana, I did kendo and really immersed myself in that experience. And as I think about students who came from my public school, John Dewey High School in Brooklyn, 
Brooklyn or PS 269 on Nostrand Avenue in Brooklyn to make that transition there. There's the talent that's in those public schools and there's the hunger that's there and it's a matter of creating those opportunities and as I think about Goldman and our philanthropic footprint, we're committed to bringing more of those opportunities to more places across the United States and abroad. Then you went to Swarthmore and Columbia Law School and became a lawyer for a while. Yes. What was that thinking about? You know, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to think about social justice and impacting that. And then I got into working on transactions. So I was an M&A lawyer for a, number, uh, for a number of years. And then when I came to Goldman, I came to Goldman in a legal capacity. And one would think sort of a D lawyer to head of philanthropy is a bit of an unlikely path. But I would say it says a number of things about Goldman Sachs. It says a number of things about the CEO of Goldman Sachs, um, as well as about um, uh, John Rogers, um, our our executive chairman and in particular what it says is Goldman has a homing beacon for talent we care about athletes and we look to grow those athletes through the organization and find ways in which we can get them in seats where they can contribute more to the organization I've certainly benefited from that lens before you were an athlete at Goldman Sachs though you worked at Pfizer you worked at The Economist how did you decide when to change jobs and what was your career path thinking all about you know, it was an unlikely and a bit of a haphazard path. Andy, I wish I could tell you that I thought through every single opportunity. Right. Um, I thought about it on the lens of growing. I have a growth mindset. I've always wanted, been intellectually curious. And so when the opportunity uh, uh, for The Economist came knocking, my dad read The Economist, that little red logo was in our household, and I thought, I really want to take that opportunity. When Pfizer came knocking, it was a headhunter that called, um, and I thought that this would be great to sort of understand the pharmaceutical industry and see that grow. When I came to Goldman, that was a very conscious decision. When I worked at Cleary Gottlieb, um, the, that was at the time that Cleary was working on the Goldman IPO. And I remembered the excitement around the team working on that IPO, and I said, I wonder if I could ever work at Goldman Sachs and could I swim in that pond and could I be successful in that pond? And I remember going to an open house at Goldman and getting the job and I said I will take any job at any level. I want to be at Goldman Sachs and I want to see whether I could play at that level and certainly it's, it's worked out so far. Well it's funny you say pond. I mean a lot of people would say there are a lot of sharks at Goldman Sachs. I mean it's a tough environment. Right? I mean, that's what you're thinking about. Like, could I swim in that pond? That it's, it's a very competitive place. Yes. You have to be super smart. You have to be able to keep up. What has that been like? It has been an extraordinary, extraordinarily formative uh, experience in my life. One is, my dad would always say, if you're the smartest person in the room, leave the room. Well, I never have to leave the room, but it's also a place that cares and cultivates its people. There's the brand of Goldman Sachs, but there's also thinking about Goldman Sachs as an organization which is, you know, 35,000 mothers and fathers come to work at Goldman Sachs every day and figuring out how they can add the most value to the company as well as the most value to, uh, to our clients. And so it's been a really rigorous experience and it's also been the kind of experience where I feel like I've been given the opportunity and I've seized the opportunity to grow and contribute to our clients and to our client franchise. Not long after you came to Goldman, um, the Great Recession hit and all Wall Street firms were impacted, including Goldman Sachs. What was the environment like then during those, frankly, fairly dark days, and what did you see from leadership there? I think it, what it called upon is for us to be extraordinarily purposeful and extraordinarily decisive about where we would allocate our efforts and making sure that we retained our talent during that time period and stay very, very focused on the impact that we would have with our clients and communities. I think, you know, to the extent that there was any focus on anything that was, was e extraneous, having that kind of crisis happens focuses the effort, and I think you'll see that focus has continued throughout, um, throughout the last several years. What challenges have you had, Asahi, both at Goldman Sachs and on Wall Street, and as a business person being a woman of color, and how have you addressed that and overcome it? Look, some of the challenges are, you know, meeting people's expectations that they, you know, would you be given a fair shake, mm -hmm. right? Would you be given the opportunity to show what it is that you can do? But as many challenges as I've had, I've also had opportunities. As the only woman in the room or the only black woman in the room, you're certainly noticed. Um, and you can either see that as something that's, that's problematic or see it as a chance to seize that opportunity to, to raise your voice, to speak out in, of it, on an issue, um, and to really make 
make an impact on the on the organization. In particular, I feel like I really wanted to tell my story. And I feel like as a senior woman of color, telling my story, I did grow up in, in a housing project. I did um, go to public school. I did have, was a scholarship kid that went to Swarthmore. I graduated Swarthmore in three years. And people are often impressed by that. The reason I graduated Swarthmore in three years, Andy, is because my scholarship was running out. Wow. And I wouldn't be able to afford that fourth year of school, so I know, knew that I had to compress uh, the education into that three-year period. So what you know, some can see as a badge of honor is a badge of necessity. But I'm not unusual. You know, My story is the story of so many Americans, so many young people across the country of various backgrounds where it's about that tenacity and it's about that hunger and desire for an opportunity to really show and what they can do and contribute. Now you talked about the progress that Goldman Sachs has made when it comes to diversity and inclusiveness, and you also said there's more work to do. Um, what can Goldman Sachs and Wall Street do to become more inclusive, to become more diverse? Is it a matter of setting more benchmarks, doing the numbers? What, what can I, they do? I think the numbers certainly help. Look, we do what we track. You know, science shows that, the evidence has shown that. So I think certainly tracking it and being very thoughtful around that is particularly important. But I would say two other things. One is casting a wide net. You know, casting a wide net to beyond those, you know, top schools that you usually go to, to a broader group of liberal arts institutions, to a broader group of historically black colleges and universities, to international students as well. Sort of casting that broad net, I think, is another thing that's particularly important. But I think the third part is when you have those stars, keep them. When you have those individuals, cultivate them and give them opportunities throughout the organization because that has a, a catalytic impact where you see that snowball, as Warren Buffett mm -hmm. talks about, sort of building where you have a critical mass and then others are attracted to that critical mass. And one thing I have to say, our CEO, David Solomon, not only knows that but is doing all of those things. Right. Um, millennials, mm -hmm. they're different. They care about different things. Maybe some of these things like diversity, inclusiveness, and climate change more than baby boomers. Mm -hmm. How are you guys managing that cohort at Goldman? Well, 76% of Goldman Sachs are millennial and Gen Z, hmm. right? Not a lot of people know that. And that impacts exactly right, Andy, the way in which we do our business and certainly in the way in which I think about our philanthropic efforts. We did something four years ago that has been phenomenally successful to that population that I want to tell you about. It's called the Analyst Impact Fund. Now, if you dial back the lens in philanthropy, years ago, decisions around philanthropic efforts were really run by the C-suite. You know, a CEO and a small group of individuals, they made those decisions. Goldman Sachs decided to go in a different direction. Certainly we have our foundation, but we also said, what, what about democratizing that? What about allowing a broader group of individuals to be able to direct those philanthropic dollars? We've certainly done that through Goldman Sachs Gives, our donor advised partner fund, but four years ago, we launched the Analyst Impact Fund. Any company, any organization around the country and around the world, frankly, can do this as well. And what does it do? It goes out to your organization and says, is there a charity, is there any organization that you know about that, frankly, may never come to the attention to senior individuals at Goldman Sachs that's doing fantastic work, whether it's dealing with battered wives, it's dealing with the opioid crisis that's gripped our nation, whether it's dealing with water purity in, in various jurisdictions. You know about those organizations, bring them to the fore, and we will give them funding. And it's a competition where our partnership committee, our CEO, David Solomon, uh, judges the analyst presentations, and then we award um, funds to these organizations, upwards of $150,000 to organizations, and their prizes across that suite. Over a thousand analysts have participated in the program, and it's one of the most exciting things that's really galvanized our millennials and Gen Z around a purpose-driven aspect of Goldman Sachs. Really bottoms up driven, it sounds like. Yes. Um, is it also global? It is also global. The winning team actually was, uh, last year was actually a UK-based team. Oh, that's cool. Um, what about um, income and wealth inequality in this country, and how is that playing out at Goldman Sachs? I mean, you have support staff, and then you have people who are what used to be called masters of the universe, the people in the C-suite at Goldman Sachs, and there are all these statistics that point to you know, the difference between the CEO, what the CEO makes, and the lowest paid people, or the average person at the firm, and David Solomon had to go and testify before Congress. I talked to him about that recently. Um, 
Is that something that you guys are very cognizant of and, and how do you address that? Look, we're certainly focused on the development of our people across sectors. So we give opportunities to individuals wherever they sit. And as I said, it's a very athlete-driven culture. So what we look for is talent where it sits and give the opportunity of that talent to be able to move through the organization. Certainly, there will always be differences in compensation at, at different levels of any corporation across America. But the point is to see, are you giving individuals the opportunity, if they shine and they deliver, it's our obligation to uh, our, our obligation to give them the the chance to be able to move through the organization to be able to attain greater wealth creation for themselves and their family and we're certainly doing that and we find opportunities to do that for our people and one last question there you know when you see these democratic candidates i know you might not want to wade into politics but you see you know and particularly here in new york say aoc and people like her that are sort of you know, raising the temperature level when it comes to the haves and the have-nots and, you know, the banks could be in the crosshairs. Is that something you guys consider and are really looking at when it comes to running the organization? Look, we certainly think about bringing more people along throughout. And I think our 10,000 women program where we have helped women entrepreneurs in 56 countries around the world. And I have to say, Andy, it's beyond 10,000 women. We launched that program in 2008. By 2014, we'd achieved the goal of 10,000 women. You have and to we change the name. Goal. We do. Right. <laughs> you have to give us some ideas right. on changing the name. Um, yeah. And we, we decided to set a new goal, which is 100,000 women. And through a partnership with the IFC, we have a $1.2 billion facility. We've now helped 53,000 women uh, around the world. So in terms of helping with the haves and the have-nots, helping small businesses internationally and in the U.S. is going to be the way in which we can do that and our pro programs have proven that they do that. So we're going to double, continue to double down on those efforts. I think you maybe addressed this, but I want to ask you just sort of front and center. What is the goal of philanthropy when it comes to Goldman Sachs? What, what is Goldman Sachs looking to achieve with philanthropy? We always care about measurable results. We're not in the check writing business. So what we care about is having measurable results in the communities in which we work and live. And that is helping businesses grow, creating jobs in, uh, in our economy more generally. I'll give you one example. There's an entrepreneur named Holly Shook and she runs Cups Coffee in Baltimore. And Holly said, I wanted to hire a number of individuals for my coffee shop. And she put together a little flyer, Andy, and it said, you know, how much people would make, and this is the phone number that she should, they should call. But she added something else. She said, it's okay if you've had contact with the justice system. And she pasted that, that poster around, and people said, I'm not sure you're going to get very many people, Holly. I'm not sure that you're going to find people who want to work. Well, within 48 hours, over 100 people had responded to that ad. Right now, that sounds like a great story, but in fact, it's not mm -hmm. because she only had four people that she could actually hire. Mm -hmm. So the desire is certainly there to create jobs, move the needle on that. And Goldman is a part of that. So what is the commitment to your endeavors um, when it comes to the fluctuating P&L of Goldman Sachs? In other words, when the company does well, do they increase your budget? It does poorly, we're gonna cut Asahi way back because she's a cost center. Sure, we do not do that. Um, this is core, you do that when it's not core to what you do, mm -hmm. right? So you think about, you know, you, you're not gonna cut your core. You're gonna cut things that you perceive to be on the edges. Our corporate engagement and our philanthropic footprint is core to what we do, back to that culture of service of Goldman Sachs. And so that is not happening. If anything, we figure out ways in which we can be even more efficient and double down on those efforts because we know those are the efforts where we're helping Main Street. Those are the efforts where we're helping entrepreneurs in all 50 states that our 8,200 entrepreneurs come from. This may be John, John Rogers' purview, but you can tell him you're answering it for him, which has to do with immigration and visas. And, and is that part of what you look at? In other words, you do have this global footprint. You're trying to get people to work here. You're trying to have a global workforce. There are a lot of regulatory changes, which I know is not what you do, but you are looking at a holistic workforce. Mm -hmm. How do you guys approach that and try to plan the business when you have all these changes? 
Look, we, we certainly have our legal team and others that are very rigorous in terms of our hiring process around visa and otherwise, but the ways in which I interact with that is around our 10,000 uh, women program and helping entrepreneurs, certainly in India, some of them who, one of them, Madhu, who came to the United States several weeks ago, um, she's one of the first women to have her art featured at a temple, uh, at a temple in India. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about our entrepreneurs, generally they come from all around the world and some of them come to the United States. Um, and and certainly get visas to come here, but it's about that development of entrepreneurs. What is the most uh, rewarding part of your job? It has to be the people. It has to be dealing, working with the entrepreneurs, working with the people on a daily basis. When I hear about, you know, I was just in Columbus, Ohio um, uh, last week where we launched statewide Ohio. Uh, we invested an additional $15 million to entrepreneurship in Ohio. And I sat around the table, Andy, with 15 entrepreneurs who were talking about the challenges of running their business, talking about cashing out their 401k to fund their business, talking about, you know, getting access to capital um, and going to the bank and filling out the paperwork and sort of hoping and praying that you're going to get the funding that you need to move the needle in terms of the lives of each of those individuals and their businesses and knowing the blast radius of the daughter, the sister, the son that's helped as a result of that, that is extraordinarily rewarding and it motivates me as I think about my two sons, Maximilian and Sebastian, and their lives and their trajectory that one entrepreneur that you help, there's this whole ecosystem of individuals that you're helping and a community that you're uplifting as well. And you told me those guys are going to public school like you did, right? They in New York are. City? They are. They go to PS9 on right. the Upper West Side. Yeah. Right. Let me ask you a little bit about your cohort and your colleagues at other Wall Street firms, say at Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, maybe Wells, City. Do you get together with them and share strategies in terms of how to achieve, say, things when it comes to diversity and inclusiveness on Wall Street? Yes, we do. We certainly um, meet with individuals at other firms and think about what strategies are, are they employing. Um, we also, frankly, know each other. It's, it's a relatively small network of individuals, and so we see each other at events and the like, and we're friends. Um, and we all care about rising the tide of um, individuals of color, women across Wall Street, and our CEO, David Solomon, is absolutely committed to that. Sam, what about, if I may ask, your personal commitment to philanthropy? I mean, it must be so daunting in that you see so many worthwhile organizations and you do it every day. I mean, how does someone like yourself look at philanthropy, Asahi? It's hard because there are so many amazing organizations uh, that are across the country and they come to me. And so my email is often flooded and I was just at a conference uh, on Saturday and after I spoke at the conference, I had a long line of individuals telling me about their various organizations and they're doing fantastic, fantastic work. Look, you have to be discerning about where you uh, give your dollars. You have to think about what the impact is going to be uh, uh, of your giving in that particular area and sustained giving. You don't want to sort of dip in and dip out, but have a real purpose-driven commitment, and we've certainly done that through our Hallmark programs. Right, and when you have this transition from Lloyd Blankfein to David Solomon, what is that like with someone like yourself? Do you, the C new CEO said, okay, I'm committed to what you're doing and want to take it to another place, or is there sort of a handoff when it comes to responsibilities for you when the CEO changes like that? Sure, so when the CEO changed, I had a meeting with uh, David Solomon, and he said, look, we're excited uh, that you're in this seat, Asahi. And what he said to me is, bring me your ideas. I want to know where you think our philanthropic footprint needs to go. I want you to think about our 76% um, Gen X and, and millennials. I want you to think about my commitment to diversity, to advancing women. And I want you to come back with your ideas in the direction you think we should take it. And it's that kind of um, not only commitment, but autonomy that employees are given in terms of directing and really impacting the course of the firm that I think is one of our key differentiators, Andy. Is it tougher to have this job with during this administration in Washington, or does that not matter? You know, I think that, you know, it's very mission driven. So whatever the administration is, there's certainly going to be uh, there's certainly going to be challenges. If anything, it's extraordinarily motivating. There's a fire in my belly mm -hmm. around making sure that we're making an impact in the communities in which we work and live. And so I see it as fuel. Right. And uh, finally, Asahi, this show is called Influencers, and so I have to ask you, how do you see using your influence on the world? You know, I want to use my influence in being in this seat to really figure out the key communities in which 
we can make an impact and move the needle in a relatively short period of time. We're doing that with entrepreneurs. We're doing that with women. We're also going to have um, a summit on the opioid epidemic, but there are other areas as well in which we can really move the needle. And so to me, that's where my influence is going to be. And when I look back on my tenure as president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation, is seeing exactly where we've moved the needle on women, on entrepreneurs, and the key issues of our day. A lot of work ahead of you. Absolutely, but I'm up to the task. Great. Asahi Pompei, Global Head of Corporate Engagement and President of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. Andy, great, great being here. Thank you. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.